Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to Fallout Tailored to Wastelands, where last time we came in here to one of Fallout 3's most remote regions and encountered a whole bunch of really bloody obscure bits and pieces. And today, we're actually going to be coming back here again to complete the one mission that actually pulls you into this corner of the world. And that means today we're kicking off in the Museum of History, visiting the Ghoul City of Underworld again. Though just like last time, this is going to be a bit of a flying visit. I'm not going to sort out all these guys' problems, oh no. We're just going to be, uh, yes, finding uh, one person in particular, though. I won't deny, while I'm passing by, I will not say no to a bit of shopping, because seriously, a journey across the northwest corner of Fallout 3, blimey that eats your ammo supplies. Okay, mild issue I wasn't expecting, so, um, yes, the giant pile of money I made on my trip to New Vegas. Apparently I've already spent it all, so, okay, money to start, uh, yes, having a think about money again in future. For the time being, though, yeah, I've got plenty of drugs I can just trade her, so we can definitely make this trade go through at least, so there we go, that's enough to make that happen. Oh yeah, that's a bit bloody better, but, um, yes, I am basically bankrupt at this point, so... This wasn't part of the game plan. I may have to, yes, try and figure out where I'm going to make some money back at some point or another. Anyway, on to my main objective today. Here we go, Mr. Crowley will be speaking to you in just a moment because, uh, yes, there is one tiny NPC who basically doesn't really do anything in this game aside from uh, provide some very interesting hints of things to come. Uh, the lovely guy who's having a nap over here, Mr. Quinn. Oh, why, hello there. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Quinn. He's also delightfully polite, which is marvellous. I've explored all up and down the coast, from the Commonwealth to the Pit, all the way down to Crater Banks. I also do a fair bit of trading. You see, folks here, they don't have much of a connection to the outside. So I move their goods and caps out to the waste and bring back in what I trade for them. Okay, so, the three locations he just mentioned. Point Lookout, that became Fallout 3 DLC. The Commonwealth... That became Fallout 4, but he mentions one more location too, Crater Banks. And Crater Banks never gets mentioned again by anybody, and uh, I'm not saying that Crater Banks is going to be the setting of Fallout 5, but okay, I can't really back that up. I've got no evidence for it, aside from the fact he mentions Crater Banks, and this is the guy that teased both Fallout 3 DLC and Fallout 4, and yes, goes on to mention another location, but it might be, you know, and a curious addendum, if you go and speak to Tobar, the guy who runs the ferry that leads into Point Lookout, he mentions Broken Banks, another location that doesn't shop again, that may or may not be connected to Crater Banks. But yes, given Tobar mentions he takes the boat to Broken Banks, if they are the same location, it must be on the coast. So, okay, we know he's mentioned Pittsburgh and Boston. If we're talking East Coast territory vaguely in that area... Could possibly be New York City. Is New York City Crater Banks and or Broken Banks? I don't know, I'm randomly making stuff up here. But I blame Fallout 3 for that, given they're the ones that included place names that didn't go anywhere. Sorry, back to the actual bit of business we're doing today. Mr. Crowley, you've got some people you need me to kill, but um, yes, I'm rather curious how he's going to ask me to do it. Because uh, one of the people he's going to ask me to kill is already bloody dead. I've killed Mr. Tampenny already, so I do not know if maybe this lad's going to have a bit of unique dialogue for that. What are you looking at? You'd think you'd never seen a ghoul up close before. I do enjoy Mr. Crowley. He's a delight to talk to. Is that so? Even if I call you a milk-sucking, mutant-loving, water-stealing whore? I mean, I'm going to be honest, he's got me there. Like, one of my favourite characters in this game is Fox. Fox is an absolute bloody star, and uh, I've almost certainly stolen a fair bit of water. So, uh, you know what? Fair enough, buddy. You've completely got me on those points. <laughs> I like a human that knows his place. Too many of you think we're all just zombies. They don't know or don't care that we're just as human as they are inside. We bleed, we hurt, we regret... And you know what really pisses me off? They think the only way to kill us is to shoot us in the head, like in the old zombie stories, and that'll put us out of our misery. Hey, I know. Maybe you could help me even the score. And here we go. Here comes the pitch. 
Not everyone is as sympathetic to ghouls as you are. In fact, some humans are downright bigots. They treat us like zombies, calling us brain eaters and shufflers. Well, I'm gonna make them pay. Uh, before I get into the details, you don't have anything against killing, do you? Oh no, quite the opposite, in fact. Well, aren't you the bloodthirsty type? I got this list of people. Ghoul bigots. Real scum. I've only got four guys left on the list. Started out with eleven. All of them hate ghouls and treat us like we're zombies. They all deserve to die. But it has to be done with a headshot. Just like the old stories, where zombies can only be killed that way. I'll pay you a hundred caps for each one. Twenty-five if they die some other way. So there we go, a hit list of ghoul bigots that need taking down. Marvelous. Here's a list of the guys in their last known locations. Word will get around if ten pennies killed, but I'll need proof for the others. Bring me back something personal from each of them as proof. Like a key or a ring or something. Okay, when you say word will get around, how sure are you about that? Because um, he has been dead for maybe about two months in game. And as for, yes, how he died... Uh, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure, but he was killed by a ghoul, so you've got to enjoy that at least. And actually, you know what? I did see his body. The head had not exploded, so he probably wasn't killed by a shot to the head. Sorry. Good riddance. The wasteland is better off without him. Except, of course, there's a lot more to it than that. So depending on, yes, how thorough you are in your investigations at this point, you can piece together a lot of what's about to happen. So, uh, yes, indeed. Few people in note. Let's go speak to Carol right here. And then just ask her about her lodger, Mr. Crowley. The back room renter? Oh, he's a swell guest. So polite, too. Never gets mad at anyone. I've been letting that room to him for about a year now. Oh, come on, Carol. Spill the beans here. Well, he does keep talking about how he's going to make his fortune soon. He says as soon as he finds some wastelander to do his dirty work, he'll be set for life. I think it's just the whiskey talking, vile stuff. So, okay, sounds like he's motivated by making a fortune, not by any sense of good justice to me. And then there's our good friend, Mr. Quinn, right here. Crowley is running some sort of scam. He tried to get me to kill some wastelanders, but I wouldn't do it. Dave is one of them. I've met Dave and he's mighty strange, but he's no bigot. He doesn't hate ghouls any more than I do. Yes, indeed. One of the ghoul bigots is a ghoul bigots. Then just head back outside and we can piece together a few more bits of information from the shopkeeper over here. Crowley has been outfitting himself for some big expedition. He's up to something, but he isn't saying what. Okay, the lad's planning a journey or something. And as for the local repairman... Sometimes he comes by and asks me about the security system and stuff. You know, technical details about locks and computers. It's not just chit-chat either. He's angling for something, but I don't know what. Talk to Azrakal up at the Ninth Circle about Crowley. Interestingly, Azrakal doesn't actually have anything interesting to say at all. He just confirms that, yes, another person on the list is definitely not a ghoul bigot. So, okay, he's looking for somebody to do his dirty work. The people he says are ghoul bigots aren't ghoul bigots. And he's planning a journey that involves breaking some really tough locks. Fortunately, given we now know this is a big scam and the people he's implicated are completely innocent... We don't need to kill anybody to complete the mission. The simple reason being, he doesn't actually care about the people at all. When he says he wants, like, you know, a memento like a ring or something, yes, he's just after the keys. And if you've made any progress in the game whatsoever, some of them are very easy to get hold of. In particular, yes, Rivet City is by far the easiest. Here we go, the super relaxed Ted Strayer. Whoa, that's a blast from the past. My dad knew a dude named Crowley. I never met him, though. I think Dad said he died when they were checking out some old fort. And the plan starts to come together, given we know that, yes, Crowley is now planning to, again, go on a journey and break into somewhere. So, uh, Ted, tell me more about the forts. Nah. He said that old man Tenpenny hired him and some other guys to go in there, but he never said why. My dad made enough caps off it to set him up good, though. 
Alright, no more details, but we now know there was once an expedition to an old fort. Tenpenny was the one who funded it. Yes, the past is starting to come together here. And yes indeed, Mr. Strayer. I'm guessing if you were to, yes, say, give me the key, that might just be enough to get Mr. Crowley off your back. Whoa, is this like worth caps? Because I got needs, man. Okay, well that's bad news because I actually don't have much in the way of caps anymore. Like, if you caught me a month ago, I'd have tossed a thousand your way, no problem. But uh, these days, no, we're a bit tight on the old caps. But fortunately, yes, you can just speech check him together with, yes, if you've got the toughness perk or sufficient strength, you can just use those uh, to intimidate him too. But uh, no, don't need to do that on this occasion. Just give me the key, Ted, and we'll part company as, uh, well, maybe not friends. But I won't have shot you in the head. So honestly, for you, that's a huge win. Uh, sure, dude. I don't know what it's for anyway. Don't need to get all thug-like. And there we go. One special key. Lovely. And now that we've got a whole bunch of information from the underworld locals and one key, we can finally start, yes, getting some real answers out of Mr. Crowley. So, Mr. Crowley, I have it on good authority these people are not goo haters at all. You weren't supposed to talk to them. You were just supposed to kill them. Okay, okay, all I really want are those security keys. Killing them is just a bonus. Just get me the keys and I'll still pay you. I'll even throw in a hundred cap bonus. Deal? Okay, now we're getting to the truth of the matter, lovely. And just to confirm, yes, here's the key, but Ted's still alive. So long as I get that key, I don't care. Here's your caps. Alright, so there we go. Money. Was just saying I need of money. Brilliant, this is all going to work out beautifully. Still, one thing we did learn from Ted Strayer, he actually wasn't the person who went on the original expedition. Dukov, however, our next target just around the corner from the Anchorage Memorial, he most definitely was. So, he might be able to fill us in a bit more. Also, just in case you've never seen this, he does on occasion come outside just to do some target practice. He doesn't just, you know, stay inside all day, every day. Hello, sweet chicks. What can old Dukov do for you? Never mind. You need a drink. Jerry, I'm thirsty over here. Dukov is also a lot more friendly towards you if you're playing as a female character. It's kind of the easy way to get him on side because a, a quick Black Widow check, he will give you basically anything you want, including, of course, the K. So yes, indeed, Mr. Dukov. Let's talk about Crowley. He's fucking dead, that's what I can tell you. Feral ghouls ripped his nuts off and ate them for dinner. So, funny fact about that, no. Though, uh, yes, before we get to that, let's hear about the supposed death of Mr. Crowley. Uh, a little shithole called Fort Constantine. It fucked us up, but good. And with a quick speech check, we can get that on the map, though. We literally walked past it last week. If you haven't already explored that bit of the world, though, yeah, you will need one of these characters to potentially hand you the location. It's northwest of here, Nomnuts. A long fucking walk, too. Wankers like you can't get in, though. Huh? You need a special set of keys. And come on, Dukov. Keep spilling the beans here. Ten Penny hired us as mercs. He wanted some fancy fucking gun. Don't know how we got Crowley to sign on. Tenpenny fucking hates ghouls. Of course, worth noting, Tenpenny doesn't actually have a key. Crowley, at least when it comes to Tenpenny, is telling the truth. He does find it rather amusing that Tenpenny ends up dead by being shot in the head. And seriously, Mr. Dukov is just a font of information today. Haha, <laughs> no clown shoes. Tenpenny hired a whole fucking team. Stray Crowley. Tara, Dave, and me. Tara had a pair on her. <laughs> Sweet Jesus, they were nice. <laughs> that place fucked her up more than I did, huh? The rest of us went our separate ways after that. So, okay, Tara didn't survive the expedition. You were under the impression that Mr. Crowley didn't either. But, uh, yes, indeed, Crowley is actually alive. So, the meat bag is alive, huh? Fine with me. Just show me the money. Put your fucking caps on the table and you can have it. And yes, indeed, there we go. It is admittedly a very, very hard speech check, even for my character, where I'm pretty well set up for that business. And uh, 
Alternatively, Black Widow, nice easy solution. Though, my personal favourite thing is to, yes, completely back out of this conversation at this point. Here we go, let's have a nice chat to the two women he hangs out with. Now, Fantasia's pretty much into this to be honest. She's a very happy just hanging out with him, given he is a very good with a gun and experienced mercenary, so she's happy to just take the deal on the table. She hangs out with him, wearing skimpy clothes, a various hedgehog rated things occur, etc, etc. The other one, however, the lovely Cherry, she's not so certain about her life right now. Hi, sugar. I'm Cherry. Do yourself a favor. Watch yourself with Dukov. He's all hands. Cherry also has, for some reason, a unique hairstyle. No one else has got that hairstyle, and you can't put it on your character either. Very peculiar. He's a lecherous old man. The only reason I put up with him and his needs is because I'm safe here. He tends to shoot first and ask questions later. Don't pull out a weapon near him. He's likely to shoot you. And he's really good. Whether that was ever intended to be true in the game, I don't know. But she is literally wrong. You can pull out guns all day long in front of Dukov. He does not care. But yes indeed, given she's not really so into this setup, how about we make her a better offer? You've got to do something for me first. I can't live like this anymore. You take me to Rivet City, and I'll get your key. Honestly, this feels like by far the most moral solution to getting Dukov's key, given Cherry clearly is not enjoying her time here. Fantasia is, so she gets to stay. Cherry wants to leave, so we help her leave. Brilliant. Let me pack my bags. Oh, wait. I don't have any. Let's get out of here. So there we flipping go, and now I'm going to be needing the key. Can you go and get me the key quickly? Thank you. Dookie, you promised to take me to Rivet City to go shopping. Maybe next week, babe. We've got enough liquor to last for a while. That's the only thing that's important. <laughs> Here's the key. He never even noticed. And there we flipping go, and Cherry just bumps into him, and grabs the key, and now she's a temporary companion. Now the road from here to Rivet City is, yes, hardly the safest in the world, especially when you are wearing a very flimsy little nightdress. So fortunately, I think everything between me and there, handful of raiders, various super mutant camps, I've already taken care of previously, so should not be too difficult to get her from point A to point B. Plus, of course, that only matters if you actually choose to, you know, do it properly. If you step outside and fast travel to Rivet City, she will just teleport with you, thereby bypassing any mutants in the way. Lovely. So let's just uh, get her nice and safe and sound into the markets. And there we go. You know you've actually got her far enough when you see you've gained some karma. Yeah, yeah, you're my hero. Don't let it go to your head. Seriously, though, thank you for getting me away from Dugov. So there we go, Cherry is now a permanent resident of Rivet City. Here we go, give or take 72 hours, and Cherry will change her out of the sexy sleepwear and put on some more appropriate traditional wasteland garments. Though she doesn't really have anything else to say. Take care, sugar. She even gets a proper Rivet City routine, visiting the market, going back to her room at the appropriate time of day though, um, yes, there is one very slight issue with poor old Cherry. A slight oversight they made when they were, uh, yes, adding her routine into the game. Which is, even though she now lives in Rivet City, and has a bed, and a routine here and whatnot, the game never tags her as a citizen of Rivet City, meaning, um, if you just very quickly hop her in the head and make it explode, no one actually cares in the slightest. You could just shoot her dead and security will just walk straight over her corpse. But we're not going to do that, okay? That belongs in an evil alternative John Universe B. See, there we go. Much flipping better. The final key, however, is, um, yes, a fair bit more out of the way. And when I say out of the way, yeah, we're going right up to the top right of the map on this occasion to one of my favourite bizarre locations in the game, the Republic of Dave. Unfortunately, yes, we've been a very nearby to this location before. Here we go, barely round the corner from where we started, the greatest civilization in the entirety of the Fallout franchise, the majestic Republic of Dave Ark. Oh. It is truly, truly magnificent. I love this place. It's just wonderful. Stop right there, lady. 
What you think you're doing in the Republic of Dave? Don't worry, Flower. I am here as a humble visitor, come to pay my respects to the glorious President Dave. Okay, I'll take you. But President Daddy doesn't always like new people. Okay, come with me. And there we go, we're now allowed straight on in. Honestly, Border is not desperately well guarded in some ways, uh, but uh, yes, definitely we should be going to meet Dave first. Don't go looking around uh, before you meet Dave. The other locals will not like it. I do just really enjoy this place, by the way. How this shack at the end here is actually officially called uh, the Republic of Dave Capitol Building. That's just wonderful. President Daddy, there's a wastelander who wishes to see you, sir. I keep telling you, it's Mr. President. Now get back to guarding the gate. Flower is just a star. I love her. I love her so much. I am Dave, President of the Republic of Dave. You will address me as Mr. President or I will have you executed. Now, are you applying for a citizenship, asylum, or just vacationing in the Republic of Dave? So yes, indeed, a few options. You can seek citizenship, but that doesn't necessarily go down, you know, that well. It is a bit of a small, insular society. You can ask to seek asylum. But yes, by far the best answer, claim you are an ambassador from the Wasteland, here to meet with the esteemed leader of the Republic of Dave. You are? Excellent. It's good to see that the Wasteland has finally recognized the Sovereign Republic of Dave. If the people of the Wasteland are generous and respectful, I might deign to annex them. Dave is just wonderful. How he just sees the entire rest of the Wasteland as a, a single neighboring nation, which he presumably must therefore assume has a government, given an ambassador has just been sent by that government to come and speak to him and, uh, oh, Dave is just the best. Okay, you know what, Dave? Don't worry about the Mr. Crowley thing. We'll get back to that later, okay? Let's just, you know, talk about the Republic of Day for a minute. There's an election for the next president. Don't look so surprised. Can't you see this is a republic? And I'm gonna be honest, Dave. I wouldn't know. I literally just arrived. Ah, a seeker of knowledge then. Well, trust me. An election is what separates a president like myself from a monarch like my father. And yes indeed, Dave, please do educate me further about the political history of this great nation. My father inherited his political power from birth and renamed this great nation the Kingdom of Tom. Although I also inherited my political power from my father when I took over, I formed a republic so the people may elect their leader. If, by the way, you've ever been curious about the longer-term political history of the Republic of Dave, then, oh my goodness, have I got good news for you, because uh, my favourite source of uh, sort of but not really canonical information, the Fallout 3 Strategy Guide, uh, does actually flash out the history of this nation, confirming that over the course of the last two centuries, uh, this town has been the Kingdom of Larry, the Republic of Stevie Ray, Bill Sylvania, the New Republic of Stevie Ray, and most recently, the Nation of Tom, leading, of course, to the Republic of Dave. Now, given these appear to be, yes, lifelong positions, it's entirely possible that does take us back to the very founding of the Republic of Dave, when it was just a small militia settlement worried about the possibility of nuclear war. And, uh, yes, indeed, if it was Larry who originally set the place up, then he was at least onto something there, because his descendants did survive the nuclear apocalypse. Anyway, let's get back to the election, Mr. President. All right, sure, why not? The people have a tendency to wait until the last minute to vote, but I'd like just to get it over with. I'll spare a few caps if you just tell each of the adults to get over to the voting booth sometime today, so I cinch the victory. Not that I have anything to worry about. The people know who their leader is in this republic. Oh, Dave. We'll flipping see about that, buddy. Oh, and flipping perfect timing. I did not plan this, but I literally happened to have arrived at the Republic of Dave at 2pm, which is the precise time you want to visit, because a very easy thing to miss here, there is a lecture given on the history of Dave and the Republic of Dave in the schoolhouse every day at 2pm, and it is absolutely cocking marvellous. To my far right is the baby carriage that our great leader slept in as a newborn baby. Unlike most babies, he never cried, 
and his poop didn't stink. Dave had eight siblings and made his own baseball team. The team was so good, in fact, the Wasteland team was so scared, it never showed up to compete. The briefcase is the very one Dave took with him when he became fed up with the poor ways that his father ran the nation. Dave brought back many items from the Wasteland. It was artifacts like these that amassed the Republic's great wealth. Dave collects many war collectibles, including holotapes and war weaponry. This globe represents the whole planet that Dave traversed. Don't let its size fool you. The world is at least 50 times bigger than this. I don't know who put that tire there. These weapons were used against the USA before the bombs fell. Dave probably acquired these when he walked to China. Dave is a world-renowned marksman, known for shooting an apple out of the hand of a raider from across the Potomac. Mounted to my left is the very head of the slain Deathclaw that Dave encountered during his quest through the wastes. I know what you're thinking, and no, that's not a Brahmin skull. Brahmin have two heads, so there'd have to be two skulls for it to be Brahmin. Please, no touching. And that's the tour. I hope you enjoyed it. Shauna's great. I love Shauna and I love the tour so much. Knowledge to Shasin does indicate roughly what happened at some point during the Republic's history. It would appear that yes, rather than just passing peacefully from father to son, Dave was actually at some point exiled, wandered the waste a bit, came back with some guns and took out his father. And of course, while we're passing by, there is also the Perception Bobblehead. So okay, 10% more accurate with all ballistic and energy weaponry. Lovely. Still can't chat with Shauna outside and make sure to ask her about the museum accepting donations. I'd never really thought about that before. Why do you ask? Because with a quick speech check, you can convince her you've got some souvenirs from Dave's past for sale. Oh, wonderful. I'd be happy to accept your contribution on behalf of the Republic. And Dave just increased the budget for the museum this year, too. I was going to buy books for the children. But this is far more important. And there we go. She now becomes a shop. I say a shop. She doesn't actually have anything to sell, but she will buy things and she's got a fairly generous 700 caps on her. So that's good at least. And let me tell you, Shauna, I have got some treasures for you. I have got the drugs that Dave didn't do because he is such a great and noble person. He had no need for medex, as it turns out. And he was so damn charming, he just didn't need these mentats either. So, let's get back to the election here, which is, uh, there are five people who can vote in the election. Basically, the local adults. Dave himself, his two wives, uh, and his two eldest children, Bob and Shauna, who we just ran into. And, uh, despite Dave's comments, and no doubt the thorough work done by the Bureau of Dave-like Activities, uh, yes, there is a bit more political unrest in this nation uh, than you might hey, expect. Here we go. Rose is actually a really fun character because, yeah, unlike various other people in the Republic, you get the feeling she's not entirely drunk the Kool-Aid. Like, she likes Dave and she likes being here, otherwise she wouldn't be here, but yeah, she's not going along with the propaganda in the same way everyone else is, so... Uh, just ask her about herself for a moment. Not much to say, really. I'm Dave's wife, or first wife, I guess. I've lived here for mm, many years now. Oh, come along, Rosie. Let's dig into that first wife comment, because you didn't sound entirely convinced by that. Well, yes. Dave and I were married when he was wandering the wasteland, before inheriting the Republic from his father, Tom. After Ralph was born, Dave said that the President of the Republic needed to repopulate the Wasteland. So, now we have a second wife. <sighs> so yes indeed, she's not entirely certain about this, and uh, tell me about the Republic, Rosie. We have plenty of food and water here, and the compound is fairly safe. I'm glad the children can be raised here, away from the Wasteland. I'd like to see more trading done with the local caravans, but Dave's afraid their outside influence could weaken the Republic. So okay, she has got good things to say. I mean, she has children, and they're not dead. That's honestly quite an achievement in the Fallout 3 Wasteland, but she'd like to see changes too. So, on that basis, let's get back to that election. Rosie, 
How about you consider running to be president? Believe it or not, I used to lead a group bigger than this one on an old caravan route. I did it for years, and we did pretty well for ourselves. But what am I talking about? Running against Dave would be like betraying him. Yes, I know. It sounds cooking hilarious. You're right. Dave's just been pushing me around. It's time for a change. So there we go. Rosie is now going to run for president. And next up, Mr. Bob, Dave's the eldest son, so next in line to be ruler already. Now, Bob, I have heard the story of this place, alright? Your dad basically kicked out your granddad. So why don't you kick out your dad? That seems legitimate and entirely in line with how stuff works around here. Man, I'd love to be the president. Everybody would have to listen to me or I could just exile them to the wasteland. And the first thing I'd do is make myself the permanent leader so they couldn't vote me out in some other election. But there's no need for me to run. One year, Dave is just going to make me the leader, just like my grandpa Tom did for him. Bob's testimony does cast some doubt as to precisely what happened during the handover to the Republic of Dave, because Shauna and Dave both implied there was some form of, you know, uprising. Possibly, Dave was exiled by Tom, came back, and seized power. But yeah, Bob implies it was a peaceful transfer of power, so it is not entirely clear what happened in the previous generation, but come on, Bob. Even though it is blatantly a terrible idea and a very hard speech check too, let's get you on the ballot paper. I'm not stupid. You're just pushing me around. Unfortunately, yes, it is a very hard speech check. Fortunately, though, it doesn't actually cocking matter. If you just taunt him for being too young, he'll just agree to do it anyway. Too young? Too young? I am so sick of everyone around here pulling that you're too young crap with me. I'm tired of it. I'm old enough to take Dave's place. I'll win that election and show everybody. So there we go. He just decides he's going to run anyway. Speaking of which, off you go to the ballot box, buddy. I will admit, this is the point where this quest does rather disappoint me, which is uh, there is no way to engineer a legitimate victory for either of the other candidates. Dave will always vote for himself. Rosie will always vote for herself. Bob will always vote for himself in the event that both are standing. If only one is standing, Bob will never vote for Rosie, and Rosie will never vote for Bob, leaving only two electors. And of course, given everybody votes for themselves, the other two electors will always be able to carry the election. And those two electors are... Number one, we've got Shauna right here. President Dave is the savior of the wasteland, bringing peace and order to the savages man has brought upon himself. If you would like to learn more, please stop by the Museum of Dave's official tour at 2 p.m. And yes, indeed, Shauna has definitely drunk the Kool-Aid. And then, of course, there's Jessica. That's President Dave to you, Wastelander. Call him by his full name, or we'll shoot you. He takes care of all of us, even that selfish Rosie and her brats. My children will be a lot nicer than hers. Jessica is heavily incentivized to support the status quo. If Bob or Rosie takes over, yes, her position looks a lot more precarious, and she can't be persuaded to run herself. This means there will always be three votes for Dave, and there is no way for there not to be. Jessica, Shauna, and Dave will always vote for Dave, and I just think that's a really huge missed opportunity that you can't engineer a legitimate victory for everyone else. Now, you can cheat, which is what we're going to do, but um, yes, I do think it's just a real shame that there's no way to set up an election where Dave legitimately loses. That would be much more fun, to my mind. Though, yes, before we move on from Jessica, ask her about herself, and uh, yes, we get one rather interesting tidbit, another bit of information from Dave's past. Just because Rosie used to be this big leader out in the wasteland, she thinks she's better than me. She even ordered Dave around once. Okay, the picture there is starting to come together. Dave was exiled from the Nation of Tom and travelled around the wasteland. At the same time, he met Rosie and they got married. At the time, Rosie was running a caravan company. And we now know from Jessica, Rosie at one point gave orders to Dave. Logical conclusion, Rosie was the trader running a caravan, 
Dave was a mercenary that she hired to keep the caravan safe. The sort of scenario we see all across the other caravans. But yes, he wouldn't be willing to admit it now. Okay, and here comes Shauna with what should be the final vote. Once that's done, it will be ballot counting time. So, fun fact about the selection. In the event that a tie is engineered somehow or another, Dave will declare himself leader anyway. Though this can only be engineered by stealing votes in order to create a tie. Though, that does lead me to, yes, a question I don't know the answer to. Which is, what happens if I generate a tie between Rosie and Bob? Zero votes for Dave, one vote each for Rosie and Bob. At that point, who's declared the winner? Oh, though before we actually, yes, kick off the election that might cause some, uh, drama locally. Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot about the Mr. Crowley business. There's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Before the people elected me president, I worked with a mercenary named Mr. Crowley. We were part of an expedition to Fort Constantine. Yes, indeed. Tell me more, Dave. Two of us died, including Crowley. The rest achieved the mission goals and were paid. And of course, we know that isn't true, but let's get back to business. Crowley's alive, Mr. President. Alive? I always wondered. He was locked in with a bunch of feral ghouls. They won't attack ghouls, you see. The key is part of the Republic of Dave treasury. I couldn't possibly part with it. And yes, indeed, I could, if I wanted to, just speech check him into handing it over, but we're not going to do that because we could do something far more hilarious. Speaking of which, Mr. President, the votes are in. So just get myself a nice and a hidden round the back of the box because, uh, yes, right now it is locked and you need a key to open it, so just get yourself uh, hidden away. Use a stealth boy if necessary. Let's see what we have here. So here we go, let's pull out all of the votes for Dave, and leave a one for Bob, and one for Rosie. I have no idea what's about to happen as a result of this. Hmm. After counting the votes, the president is... Well, despite the hiccup, it looks like I am still declared the winner. Okay, Hello. so in the event that Dave gets zero votes, and Bob and Rosie get one each, he just declares himself the winner anyway. So okay, never mind, he does completely cheat under that scenario. So no, 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 no. That's not what we're doing. I think, you know, it's pretty obvious who ought to be the leader. And it's Rosie. Not least as, uh, yes, if you do make Bob the leader, everybody seems rather unhappy with the situation. He's not very good at the job. No, no, no. Instead, on this occasion, just take all of the votes, with the exception of a Rosie. Now, how on earth Dave thinks this is a legitimate result, I do not know. But then, as we've established, Dave is not the sharpest tool in the sheds. Wait a minute. Has somebody tampered with the ballot box? Hi there. Hmm. So long. After counting the votes, the president is... Rosie? Rosie can't be president. No. This is unfair. This can't be. Fine, I'm leaving. See how you people do without me. Enjoy your new president. And immediately, Bye. Dave decides to storm out of the Republic forever. I guess you're wondering where I'm going. I'm off to annex old only and forge the new Republic of Dave. Don't try to stop me. Oh, Dave, I wouldn't flippy dare. And yes, Dave is in fact true to his word, he does genuinely go to Old Olney though. There's a good chance he won't even make it that far given, yeah, there are rad scorpions dead ahead, there's a death claw over to the right, right over there, so yeah, mostly he doesn't make it. To get there you need to pretty much clear the entire path for him, and also Old Olney itself, which is a death claw nest, but if you do take out every enemy for him, all that happens is, yes, he just ends up squatting in an alley saying it's the new Republic of Dave. Nothing else happens whatsoever. And on this occasion, I'm pretty sure he's about to die to, yeah, the very first pair of scorpions. One random NPC with a basic uh, armor. No chance against two giant scorpions. And yep, yeah, I'm pretty sure Dave's dead immediately. Marvelous. But it was not me that did it. Not my bloody fault. Just knock over the scorpions. Take them out nice and fast. Lovely. And there we go. Some ammo, a key, etc, etc. Lovely. 
Still, back to the democracy of Rosie, let's check in with her, because yes indeed, as she was saying, she's going to open this place up, bring in the caravans, etc, etc. Congratulations, Rosie! I won it? Are you sure? Oh man, I can't believe it. I won't let the voters down, I promise. I love how she says that when it is literally impossible to get anybody else to vote for her. The only vote for her was from her. Still, before we leave, I may as well just rob the place because, yes, we've now got the key to open up Dave's special safe and giving me Old Painless, the unique variant of the hunting rifle, which is, okay, it's not that good in many ways. Gets a bonus crit chance, that's nice. We've got many better guns. The kindest thing I can say about Old Painless is, one, it is by far the most powerful way to use 32 ammunition, which is very common, and two, it's got basically zero spread. Very accurate at range, which obviously, yes, is easier to take advantage of in Tale of Two Wastelands because you've actually got proper iron sight aiming. Okay, that's the Republic of Dave taken care of, and that means there are a few things we can do at this point. Number one, we can simply go to Fort Constantine and crack it open ourselves, or rather, you can do that in the event you've kept all the keys for yourself without handing over any to Crowley. Though, you need to hand over at least one key to start getting the full story out of him. So, I've handed over Ted's key already, meaning I can't do that right now. So, does that mean I've screwed up and now can't go and rob the fort myself? Absolutely not, because there are two other solutions. One is just, you know, give him the rest of the keys, get paid, take the XP, never worry about it again. You don't even need to know anything about the fort. If you never ask anyone about anything, just go, kill the people, with a headshot, get the keys, you never learn about the fault at all. But instead, there's a middle option. Hand the keys over to Crowley, and then just, you know, wait for them to become available again. Because, you see, just like every character in this game, when he wants to get from point A to point B, he can't just teleport. He has to actually walk. Now, if you're not nearby, the game just kind of assumes that he makes it, then he is allowed to teleport. But if you rather inconveniently hang around too nearby to him, he needs to keep on walking. And uh, it's a long bloody walk. In fact, it's pretty much the longest walk in the entire game. It's ridiculous. He's almost at bloody Raven Rock, starting in the DC ruins. So, uh, if I just, you know, hang out with him, there is no chance in hell he is making it to the fort. Alternatively, I could just, you know, take the path of least resistance and steal the keys straight back off him, meaning now I've got all the keys. Or you know what? How about the best of both worlds? Sell him literally all the keys. Finally, I have the keys. Your job is done, and you've been paid, so move along. I have a trip to plan. So there we go. I've got myself some lovely XP, some lovely money, etc, etc. Also, I'm level 20. Ooh. Okay, didn't realize I was about to be level 20. That's an important level. Well, then again, you know what? It was an important level back in the day. These days, not actually so much. Just a dump that straight into the always useful sneak because uh, screw everything else just go straight down to the bottom because we have got ourselves a grim reaper's sprint but obviously yes it's new vegas grim reaper's sprint where you only get back 20 action points the original fallout 3 grim reaper's sprint was ridiculous but then the old level cap was 20 so it was supposed to be a dumb end game perk so i guess that does make sense and now the moment he steps outside, just help myself to some lovely keys. You haven't seen any of those keys, have you? I seem to have lost one. Oh my goodness, I did not know this, but he's got a unique voice line for if the keys go missing. Oh, that's so cool, I did not know that was a thing till right now. And that brings me back to the fort. We pretty much passed by this location. Yeah, there's one of the uh, lovely SATCOM arrays uh, right there. Though, to be honest, Jess, there is a lovely, lovely spawner of... Uh, there they are. Those guys over there, the Brotherhood Outcasts, they just spawn nearby, guaranteed, uh, and they will pretty much just clear out the exterior for you. Which is very nice of them, it must be sad. In fact, never mind, that wasn't even... Okay, that was, that was a different group of outcasts. There are just many outcasts around today, I love it. Anyway, back to the fort. What I love about this location is uh, there's actually a fake location in this location, which is uh, you arrive at this fort, you'd logically assume this was the target, you know, the important building. 
It's not. This building is a decoy. There is nothing of note here. It just gets you up to the roof and the roof has nothing on it. Just a bunch of robots, nothing important. And uh, speaking of robots, yeah, I've gone and grabbed the shocker. Because seriously, that thing worked very well against the sentry bots. Our destination today is instead uh, right here. This tiny house by the edge of the fort, the CO Quarters. And this place contains something rather interesting if you actually think about it, which is, yeah, just uh, nip down into the basement, lovely, and we have got a cracked open safe. Bear in mind, of course, yes, as we're going to find out in a moment, this was a major bomb storage facility. This place is full of nukes. This place is a launch site, in fact, for intercontinental ballistic missiles. And what do you find right next to this safe right here? You find a stealth boy and a Chinese Army Spec Ops training manual. Now, I'd say that's pretty bloody compelling evidence that the Chinese had infiltrated this facility. Possibly as far as them being the ones who actually cracked open that safe. Oh, and this is a very cute. I was wondering what was going to happen here. Yes, in the safe itself, this is where you get the big guns bobblehead in Fallout 3. But big guns isn't a skill anymore, so they've made a survival bobblehead. Oh, that's adorable. So yes, chems and food now last 10% longer. Lovely. Take a giant pile of ammo. Huge number of caps, but most importantly, right at the rear, the launch codes. Alright, in a safe, cracked open, right next to a stealth boy and a Chinese stealth manual. Clear evidence that some form of Chinese special forces were basically very close to getting hold of America's launch codes. I mean, you could also read it as, yes, this random dead wastelander here. He was the one who cracked the safe and then was killed by the robo-brain upstairs, but... It doesn't make a huge amount of sense when you factor in why would a random wastelander have access to, yes, both a stealth boy and the Chinese ops training manual. It just feels unlikely. This guy came along later, but I don't think he was the one that actually cracked the safe. Anyway, now we're here. Key number one, Ted Strayer's key, gets me access to the bunker. Beautiful. Just a sneak on through because, yes, indeed, we do have various robots dotted about here. Don't mind me, buddy. Please don't fire. Plasma really cocking hurts. Right, just give him a punch with the old uh, shocker. That's going to do some good work to you, buddy. There's a good crit right there. Okay, he's already almost dead. Probably should use the shotgun to knock down the gutsies first. But honestly, I'll take that. That's still pretty darn good. The place is also swimming in skill books here. So yeah, you've got Bigger Book of Science over in this direction. You've got Duck and Cover right over there too. Lovely. And perhaps more importantly, we've got Launch Control right here on this lovely, lovely desk. So uh, yes, we did pick up the codes earlier. How about we just push the button that launches the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile? It's just a... Uh, do that. Verified threat. Lovely. Everything goes all red and angry. Doors slam shut. Just like the weapon we ran into last week, the satellite weapon. Yet another super weapon you can just activate by pushing one button. Though, on this occasion, missile launch error targeting navigation corrupted. So, I tried to launch a nuke, but unfortunately, or fortunately if you will, yes, I was not allowed to do so. But yeah, Fallout 3 is just filled with weapons of mass destruction you can stumble across and vaguely prod at until they explode. Still, just to keep on heading down broadly, yes, if you see stairs, go down them, you'll be doing a good job. And bloody hell, we've got more army sentry bots. Yeah, you just uh, come out into the room, buddy. Here we go, and now, yes, the ancient martial art technique I've discovered of just standing behind these guys and turning to stay behind them. Bloody hell, this should not work, but it works beautifully. Right, down you go, brilliant, and uh, here we go. There's Tara, the other mercenary that was hired, so that gets me yet another key. Beautiful. Keep cracking open the doors, and we can just keep on going deeper and deeper. In fact, that straight away gets me to, yes, my final destination. This is actually where we were supposed to be going. 
Say hello to the DC Journal of Internal Medicine and also, I guess, some piece of power armor or something. So, yes indeed, there is a piece of power armor here that is uh, the joint most powerful piece of power armor in the entire game in Fallout 3. It shares its damage resistance with the Hellfire armor that was added by Broken Steel. So, joint strongest armor in the game. Now, obviously, it's had to go over to damage threshold, so I'm assuming this thing is going to have uh, ridiculous stats on it. So just disable the stasis field, grab the T-51B and associated helmets. Oh, you know what? That'll do. DT-20 and DR-45. Okay, that is some lovely, lovely blended stats right there. Though tragically, I cannot put it on because I can't figure out how armor works. You can at this point just retrace your steps or you can keep going forward to bomb storage to, yes, guard the back way and, uh... Yes, as you can see, this is where America was keeping its very, very big bombs. An area which clearly had, to some extent or another, been infiltrated by the Chinese. There's even a second Stealth Boy located down here in the barracks. Now, Stealth Boys don't necessarily guarantee that they were Chinese, but we do know from, say, Operation Anchorage, it was anticipated this would be something that the Chinese military would use, and the American military generally are not expected to. So... Again, just more and more evidence that this place had been infiltrated. And if you use the location of the Chinese Ops training manuals as a vague indication as to where potentially Chinese agents might have been able to embed themselves, you get a really interesting picture, which is, uh, remember that lovely SATCOM array we went to last week? The one that had, you know, access to nuclear satellites and whatnot? There's a Chinese spec ops in that building, and there's also one in the US Capitol. And there's also one in a Pennsylvania Avenue hotel just around the corner from the White House. I think somebody at Bethesda, when they were deciding which skill book went where, was trying to tell a story with the placement of those books about just how infiltrated pre-war America had been. Oh, and just for fun, if you come out of the base and just go up the hill slightly, you can actually find the silo door that the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile is supposed to launch out of. Though, unfortunately, yes, I don't think it actually does anything whether you do or don't try and fire the nuke, given it doesn't actually fire. But still, it's nice that it's here. And if you are curious, Mr. Crowley will now not speak to you anymore. He'll simply be very annoyed that you effectively robbed him. Though, in my universe, it's not clear whether he's referring to, yes, the power armor, which is what he wanted, or the keys, which I also stole from him, it must be said. Meanwhile, if you just let him come to the base, he'll be wearing the power armor himself when you check back in with him in a few days' time. At which point you can just kill him and take it for yourself anyway. So, yes, there are many, many ways to get hold of the power armor. Honestly, the easiest way is just to let him get it for you and then kill him and take it off him later. That arguably is, uh, yes, easier than dealing with various sentry bots. Still, with what may well be the most powerful armor in the game acquired, how about we call it a part there? Because uh, next week, I'd like to actually, you know, take some steps towards being able to wear that armor. And that means we need to make a bit of progress with the main plot. Because, uh, sure, we've been having some fun with the side missions, but there is some good, good stuff on the main track too. So, join me next week as we make a bit of plot progress. Hopefully, you are looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rad scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet, though. I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.